This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin in Yemen, where the government's on the edge of civil war amidst intense clashes with Shia Houthi rebels and an attack on two mosques that left more than 130 people dead. Over the weekend, rebels took over the country's third largest city, Taiz, and its military airport. Now, the United States has evacuated its remaining military personnel, citing the country's deteriorating security situation. Meanwhile, the U.S. has recorded called approximately 100 special operations forces from a southern military base seen as key in its drone campaign against al-Qaeda militants. The Obama administration had previously praised the Yemeni government as being a model for successful counterterrorism partnerships. But it closed its embassy in the capital city of Sana'a earlier this year, after Houthi rebels overtook the city and deposed President Abdurrahu Mansour Hadi. In recent days, unidentified warplanes have reportedly bombed Hadi's Aden headquarters. He recently wrote a letter to the United Nations requesting, quote, urgent intervention. On Sunday, the U.N. Security Council convened an emergency meeting to discuss Yemen's political crisis. The U.N. special advisor to the country, uh, Jamel Benamar, warned the situation could become a, quote, Iraq, Libya, Syria scenario. It would be an illusion to think that the Houthis could mount an offensive and succeed in taking control of the entire country, including Marib, Taz, and the South. It would be equally false to think that President Hadi could assemble sufficient forces to liberate the country from the Houthis. Any side that would want to push the country in either direction would be inviting a protracted conflict in the vein of an Iraq-Libya-Syria combined scenario. Meanwhile, during Friday prayer, suicide bombers attacked two mosques in Sana'a, killing more than 130 worshippers and wounding hundreds. The so-called Islamic State took credit for the coordinated attack. State Department spokesman Jeff Rathke denounced both the mosque attacks and the ongoing attacks on U.S.-backed President Hadi. We express our condolences to the families of the victims, and we deplore the brutality of the terrorists who perpetrated today's unprovoked attack on Yemeni citizens who were peacefully engaging in Friday prayers in their places of worship. We also strongly condemn the March 19 airstrike targeting the presidential palace in Aden. We call upon all actors within Yemen to halt all unilateral and offensive military actions. And we specifically call on the Houthis, former President Saleh, and their allies to stop their violent incitement and undermining of President Hadi, who is Yemen's legitimate president. The way forward for Yemen must be through a political solution. For more, we go to London, where we're joined by Iona Craig. She's a journalist who was based in Sana'a, Yemen, for four years as a Yemen correspondent for The Times of London, was awarded the Martha Gellhorn Prize for Journalism in 2014. Iona, welcome back to Democracy Now! Please just describe what's happening in Yemen today. Um, well, at the moment, you've got a complex fracturing um, of, of various different political groups. So in the north now, you have the Houthis in control in Sana'a, and Hadi, the president, is down in the south, in Aden. Um, in the midst of all that, you've got uh, tribal groups who are aligning themselves one way or the other. Uh, you've got the secessionists, the southern movement in the south, who are calling for independence. Some of those, uh, the militia groups, have aligned themselves to Hadi. Um, but really, a lot of them are looking for this opportunity to fight the north, um, because they really see the Houthis as Ali Abdullah Saleh in, in disguise and have long-held grievances against him. So you've got multiple factions who are ready to fight. Um, some of them are already fighting uh, for different motivations. How it has come to this point at this point? Um, well, really, this has been a, a, a car crash in slow motion to watch it. Um, this has come after the Arab Spring in 2011, when Ali Abdullah Saleh signed over power. He was granted immunity from that point, and he was allowed to stay in Yemen. Um, and so he was allowed to still continue in, in politics, really, and keep, keep manipulating, as he always had done, for, but from then on, from, from the side. And really, this was then seen to be a, a 
a plan of action then to use the Houthis um, as a way of almost getting revenge against Islam, Yemen's equivalent to the Muslim Brotherhood, and creating the scenario that we are now in in Yemen. Um, and Hadi has been forced into a corner as a result of all of this. Um, so it's really as a, as a result of events uh, after the Arab Spring and the transition deal that was then signed um, that didn't address the grievances of the Houthis or the Southern Movement uh, and others. And despite the international community pushing on with the transition, um, it was almost inevitable that this was going to come to a head at some point. <clears throat> On Saturday, the Yemeni president, Abdurrahman Mansur Hadi, accused the Houthi militia of staging a coup against him. He said he would raise Yemen's flag in the Houthis' northern stronghold. Hadi called on all political groups to attend peace talks in Saudi Arabia. I call on all political parties to feel the seriousness of the current phase and ignore inadequate partisan views. I call on them to actively participate in the talks to be held in the Secretariat General of the Gulf Cooperation Council in Riyadh, to come up with resolutions in order to avoid Yemen's plunging into secession and violence, and to have determination to correct the track of the political process. The U.S. has supported the president, Hadi, but who in, uh, in Yemen supports him, Iona Craig? Well, at the moment, um, in Hadi's position in Aden, he's been um, encouraging and, and uh, employing, really, uh, local militias there, the popular committees that existed in the South anyway and had done since 2011, who were set up to fight al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and Ansar al-Sharia, um, are now uh, aligned to, to, to Hadi. Um, more recently, after the bombing of his compound in Aden uh, just a couple of days ago, there have been units of, of the Air Force that have also um, aligned themselves with Hadi. So there were fighter jets that were flown from um, the eastern province of Hadramount down to Aden, um, because obviously without air power, he's also going to be struggling to defend himself. Uh, so who is stronger militarily? It really looks like the Houthis and 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 the supporters uh, and sympathizers of Ali Abdullah Saleh are. They have the heavier weapons. Um, they did have the complete con you know control of the air force, although that's now divided. The military still remains divided. Um, but if it came out, it came down to an all-out fight, uh, it's not clear who, who would win that fight, but it probably looks like the Houthis and Ali Abdullah Saleh. On Friday, a journalist asked State Department spokesman Jeff Rathke if the U.S. is worried about Yemen collapsing. This is what Rathke responded. Well, a civil war would be a, 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 you know, a terrible um, uh, development uh, for Yemen, but that's why we believe it's essential for, uh, for all the parties and, and groups to avoid unilateral actions, to avoid violence, as I, as I mentioned uh, at, the, at the top. And that's why we, along with international partners, the Gulf Cooperation Council, um, the United Nations, uh, are supporting a, a Yemeni, Yemeni political transition uh, process. Uh, mm -hmm. Political instability is, uh, is a threat to, uh, to the well-being of all Yemenis. That's State Department spokesperson Jeff Rathke. Your response, Iona? Well, I mean, of course, the, the main concern of, of America really is, is the counterterrorism issue. Um, and certainly, you know, the only way out of this domestically in Yemen um, is negotiations. But um, it's, it's looking increasingly like there's going to be more conflict and more war. Um, and really, the international community uh, has very little in now influence in, in the outcome of that. The Americans, along with the other Western embassies, all left earlier this year, um, left their embassies in Sana'a. Um, now, you know, Jamal Benamar is really the front for the international community in trying to arrange these talks. Um, and then, of course, you've got the regional powers who also have an interest. Uh, but, you know, the American focus has always been in Yemen, primarily one of counterterrorism. And that sort of model for, for, for Washington now has all but been erased. Let's talk about <clears throat> let's talk about those regional interests. Um, you've got Saudi Arabia and also Iran. What role are they playing? Um, well, always, you know, the Houthis' opponents have, have said that uh, they are supported by Iran. And certainly, you know, the, the rhetoric of um, uh, over recent months from Tehran has, has suggested and made it pretty clear that, that they do support the Houthis. Um, and once the Houthis took Sana'a, there were daily flights started between Tehran and, and Sana'a. Uh, and meanwhile, there's, you know, Saudi Arabia's interest, obviously, they have a concern over the rise of the Houthis. They fought the Houthis before. Um, 
um, but at the same time, they, they, they run something of a risk by supporting Hadi if he is not going to survive. Um, so the Saudis have been very much involved in backing and supporting some of the tribal groups who are looking to oppose the Houthis' expansion and are preparing to fight the Houthis if they move into their areas, particularly in Marib and in Shabwa. So the Saudis are obviously concerned because a complete collapse in Yemen not only raises the issue of, uh, of terrorism issues, but it also means that they've got the risk of, of, of Yemenis running over the border looking for money, employment, and also when you get the, the, with the worsening humanitarian situation, which there is in Yemen right now, if it does fall into, into an all-out war and, and, a, and a civil war, then there are going to be many people looking to flee Yemen um, over the border into Saudi Arabia. Last week, a prominent Yemeni journalist was assassinated in the capital, Sana'a. Uh, Abdul Karim al Kawani was reportedly shot dead near his home by gunmen riding a motorbike. This is a clip of him speaking in 2010 at the Oslo Freedom Forum, uh, talking about the Yemeni government's crackdown on journalists. The independent press is considered treasonous for its alleged ties to foreign powers whenever it, de whenever it deviates from the official per personality cult around President Saleh. I have been a journalist since, 19, uh, since 1990. I am not the most brilliant journalist in Yemen, but an example of what journalists are subjected to. Oppression, kidnapping, imprisonment, beatings, newspaper bans or even closures, and Internet website censorship. We, we didn't give up on our belief in democratic v values, as we believed initially the government's promises of pluralism. However, as journalists, we warned against dangers, envisioned Yemen's future. We were drunk, drunk as we were with dreams of liberty. We exposed corruption, rights abused, and called things as they were. We discussed publicly how the country is ruled and pointed to the root causes of terrorism. We shared with Yemenis the whispers from under the rulers' table. The government response came in even tougher repression of journalists, imprisonment, kidnappings and newspaper closures. <clears throat> that was Yemeni journalist Abdul Karim al Kawani. He was assassinated last week near his home in Sana'a. Um, Iona Craig, you worked in Yemen and particularly in Sana'a for years. Did you know him? Um, yes, I knew Abdul Karim. I think, you know, everybody knew him. He was something of a, of a legend amongst the journalist community in Sana'a. Um, uh, he was a Houthi activist, he was, um, but he was also a very outspoken critic of Ali Abdullah Saleh. He'd been a journalist for 25 years, and he, during the wars in Sana'a, uh, sorry, in Sada in the north against the Houthis from 2004, he had um, really tried to cover that conflict and show the atrocities that had been carried out by the government when they had been bombing their, their own population in Sada, when it was a very difficult place to access. Uh, journalists couldn't get there. Even the UN agencies couldn't get access um, to the area. And he, he ended up in jail as a result of criticizing Ali Abdullah Saleh. So although he was a Houthi supporter and activist, he was much more than that, um, and a very uh, outspoken voice from, for a long, long time against the old regime and against Ali Abdullah Saleh. Any thoughts on who killed him? Well, he was one of the last or last moderate voices of the Houthi movement, really. I mean, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula claimed responsibility um, for his assassination, but really it's got to be viewed as, as a politically motivated assassination. He, um, as I said before, he was a very outspoken critic of, of, of Saleh, and he certainly didn't pose a threat to Al Qaeda in any way. He, you know, he wasn't a fighter; he was a journalist. Um, so, for him to be assassinated in this way, and for Al Qaeda to claim it, it certainly doesn't uh, doesn't seem to have appeared in iso uh, happened in isolation. That there was certainly some kind of political motivation behind that killing as well. Iona Craig, the U.S. says they've pulled out their last remaining military, a hundred special. Operations forces that ran a drone base in Yemen. Can you talk about the significance of that base? 
Um, well, Al Anad is in southern Yemen, um, and it's between sort of Tyres and uh, Aden, where uh, Hadi is positioned now. And of course, the Houthis are now taking control of Tyres. So it's strategically important um, air base as well, uh, and it's a very important place for Hadi to have control of if he was going to be able to protect himself in Aden. And so when they withdrew, it was not just a consequence of um, apparent attack by Al Qaeda in a town in. in Huta just down the road, but it was also about the domestic uh, political struggle and who was in command of that, that base, which had been uh, led by a commander loyal to Ali Abdullah Saleh. And when, you know, who, the Hadi had an interest in making sure that he had control of that base. So it became part of the domestic political struggle. And the American troops there were really stuck in the middle. Um, and so they had little uh, option but to, to withdraw it by that stage. Finally, uh, the U.N. Uh, had a rare uh, U.N. Security Council meeting on Sunday uh, to talk about the situation in Yemen. What came out of that? And where do you think uh, Yemen will be going from here right now? And what do you think can be done? Well, I think, you know, the, a lot of what was said at the UN Security Council meeting is nothing new, um, and it's not really going to change the situation on the ground. And the Houthis um, aren't really adhering to or listening to anything the Security Council has got to say. Um, you know, it's all about calling for dialogue, which is kind of essential, but is, you know, really struggling to progress at the moment. Um, there was Qatar calling for the use of force under, under Chapter 7, which which the Gulf um, uh, community has been doing anyway, um, but nothing has come of that. And, you know, really, on, the, on uh, the most immediately now in Yemen, it's, it's certainly looking inevitable that there's going to be more conflict. The way the Houthis are progressing, the way that Hadi is trying to, to build up militias on his side, and every day we're seeing more and more conflict in, in rural areas as well as in tires at the moment, um, but at, at, at regional points both in Marib and Al-Baida in Lahij, and that seems to be becoming more regular and more widespread. Um, so really, the prospect uh, of, of a peaceful resolution are looking remote at the moment, but obviously Jamal Benamar is, is trying to do his best to um, initiate those talks and, and get a resolution at, at the end of it. But even with the agreements that have been made before, there was an agreement made in, in September when the Houthis took over Sana'a, and, and that's, you know, all but collapsed, really. It, it's vanished, um, and the Houthis just didn't adhere to that agreement. And certainly from Hadi's point of view and from Abdul Malik um, al-Houthi, the leader of the Houthis, the speeches they've been making over the last couple of days have both been mentioning dialogue, but really have been posturing for war and, uh, and really kind of looking like conflict is going to be inevitable um, on both sides. Iona Craig, want to thank you for being with us, a journalist who is based in Sana'a for four years as the Yemen correspondent for The Times of London. She was awarded the Martha Gellhorn Prize for Journalism in 2004. 14.